community coordinator for the Aperio Learning Analytics Initiative. Um, Aperio is an open source foundation. It's a not-for-profit organization uh, currently stewarding, I think, around 18 software packages focused on supporting um, what we term the academic mission. So it's uh, open source software for academia. Uh, Aperio.org, if you want to uh, check out the organization further. Um, right, so today we're going to look at ethical challenges in learning analytics. And we are so lucky to have Neil Slater uh, covering this topic for us. Neil's done a lot of work uh, around the uh, National GISC project in the UK. He's worked with a, a number of organizations. So uh, I, I think we have an awful lot to learn from Neil. Um, I, he's, he's promised to do this for us, although I know he, he's so busy and amongst other things, um, he's building his own house. Uh, so over to you, Neil, and thanks. Thanks, Patrick, and hi, everyone. I'm speaking to you from Newcastle this evening in the northeast of England, where I happen to be uh, attending some meetings tomorrow. Uh, so it's uh, great to be talking to you about this subject. It's one I'm particularly interested in. And as Patrick says, I've been doing a fair bit of work in this area over the past uh, year or two. Um, so this is going to be quite interactive so that you don't get bored just listening to me waffling on. Uh, which will mean I'm going to pose some questions to you as we go through. And then if you want to use the chat window uh, to um, respond and see what everyone else is saying, uh, that'll be good. I think I've got seven questions all together. And um, I can't remember the duration, Patrick. It's, uh, it's, it's an hour altogether, was it? Can I just check with you? Yeah, uh, that's right. Um, and we'll, we'll sort of take, take it as that. We don't plan to go on for more than an hour. Okay. Yeah, so uh, we'll, we'll aim to be finished by 6 p.m. in the UK, uh, so just, just under an hour from now. So uh, ethical challenges in learning analytics. Uh, it's, a, it's a big area. It's often the thing which uh, holds up learning analytics implementations. So it's really important to understand what these challenges are and find ways of dealing with them. And I'm going to take you through some of these challenges and we'll, we'll see if we can uh, look at some solutions as we go through. So first of all, um, if you want to just type into the chat window, what's your interest in this? Why are you here today? Uh, and just say who you are. And then everyone can just have a look at what other people are saying. And uh, we'll just kind of introduce ourselves that way. waiting with bated breath for the first one. Curious about best practices in the collection of personal data from Jim Helwig, Adriana Wild, teaching fellow at the University of Southampton and doing a PhD in learning analytics. Excellent. Kate Valenti from Unicon, keeping current on the issues that impart our customers. Joseph, part of a program of work changing the student life cycle and Learning Analytics is one of his projects. Ainsley, hi Ainsley, Learning Analytics Project Officer at the place I used to work, University of Glas uh, Strathclyde in Glasgow. Um, and I know why Ainsley's here, because she's uh, intimately involved with the Learning Analytics Project at Strathclyde and trying to deal with some of those tricky issues. Jason, interested in collaborating in higher education to help institutions surface learning analytics to staff and students. Kelly, just interested in all things learning analytics, like me. Uh, oh, right, I'm scrolling up the screen too fast now, so where did we get to? Merid uh, Kirby, data integration analyst at Newcastle. Hello there, just probably, presumably, very close to where I am at the moment. I'm just underneath that big blue bridge. Caroline Wilson, Coventry University, researcher analyzing student data. And Caroline Llewellyn from City University of London, uh, particularly interested in issues around consent, which I am too, and I'm planning to produce a bit of guidance on that shortly. Uh, and we'll post that on the GISC blog. Henry, EdTech at New York University, social work, trying to understand analytics better in general. 
I'm Moriamo. Hi, I'm Moriamo. I know you, of course, uh, and you're working with us on learning analytics at Abertay. And Lindsay, who I also know well uh, from Unicorn. Well, uh, maybe there'll be some more coming in, but that's that's probably enough to get us oriented. Um, and yeah, let's move on to the next slide. Um, just checking, everyone can see these slides all right, can they? Can they hear me perfectly well? If you could just say yes or no or something in the chat window, that would be help, helpful. Thanks, because I always find these things a bit disconcerting when I don't get any feedback. It's not like having a, a big audience. Right, we're getting some great, great stuff coming in. Uh, OK, so here's the first question for you. Uh, I'm going to do some talking as well. It's not going to be entirely just questions, but um, what is the biggest ethical challenge with learning analytics from your perspective? And we've had Adriana already say informed consent. So what else is close to your heart? Is there anything blocking learning analytics at your institution? Uh, ensuring that you don't do harm from Joseph, very important, uh, because it has the potential to harm students. Uh, Victoria, who has access to what? So, uh, yeah, uh, do you give those analytics to um, particular staff or faculty in the institution? Adriana, fear of doing harm as well. Jim, user control over their data. That's a good one. Uh, uh, I just had a connectivity problem there, but I think I'm back. Um, so we've got uh, fear translates into red tape. That's a very good point from Adriana. Um, lots of this, uh, lots of these issues get taken on by particular individuals and institutions who then create great big bureaucratic policies about them to try to deal with them and then Moriamo consent to privacy and ownership and some of you are confirming that you're interested in all of these things so that's fine uh, I'm going to be covering all of these things I think just now um, so let's crack on with the next slide if I can seem to have lost some of my buttons uh, okay you, you've lost um, the right to present I'll just find you and give ah, you that back yeah, <laughs> that, go. I've got it back thanks Patrick all right so um, now one of the issues one of the reasons for taking this all very seriously is because if we don't tackle these issues we run the risk of having problems such as they had in in bloom uh, now, does anyone know about InBloom? This was a big project uh, funded in the US by the uh, Gates and Carnegie Foundations. Uh, and it was aimed, it aimed to develop mechanisms for storing large amounts of data relating to US school children and their learning activities. And in the post Snowden era, era uh, there were lots of sensitivities around privacy and the communications of the whole project were badly handled. Uh, they wasted this $100 million funding, uh, ultimately. Families and privacy advocates uh, forced the closure of the program and the whole thing died, basically, uh, and set back the cause of the use of student data, um, uh, certainly of school children, by quite a long way. So that was one example. Uh, a second one which you may have come across was the Facebook mood experiment and this again was uh, a very controversial thing that happened um, Facebook posted the uh, particular um, negative and positive items and images in the timelines of nearly a million users to find out if they would affect the users moods there was a huge backlash from the users and a lot of uh, negative media coverage and that forced Facebook to change its research methods and its policies. So uh, what people seem to be particularly bothered about with, with that was not so much that Facebook was using um, that data 
but um, that it, they were trying to manipulate people's moods, uh, which is arguably ethically dubious, and they recognised that. Um, I think education is different from a lot of the uses of big data, or a lot of the users of big data. So uh, we do have for-profit universities, but on the whole, um, our institutions are concerned with developing the minds and the education of students uh, and carrying out research, which is hopefully uh, of varying degrees of um, usefulness to society. Um, but we are not purely driven by the bottom line at universities. We do have the well-being of students in uh, uppermost in our uh, thinking. So I think we're in a, in a very different situation uh, from normal businesses and we have a, a duty to do things ethically. I think normal businesses do as well, but I think we have even more of a duty to do that. And we have even less of a reason to do anything that is um, adverse to the interests of our customers, of our consumers, of our, of our students, our learners. So I think it's quite easy to say that universities and colleges are doing this, doing any kind of analytics for the benefit of students and for the benefit of educational processes, trying to enhance them, ultimately helping students. Now, um, one of the problems we've got, however, is flawed or inadequate data. So this is one of the biggest technical challenges for learning analytics. You find, for example, that users often pollute databases with erroneous or incomplete data. So you might get a teacher who wants to view their virtual learning environment, their learning management system from the perspective of a student, and they might set up a test account, which they then include in the analytics for the course, and that then skews the results. Another related challenge is enmeshed identities where students are working together online. So who do you know who's actually um, inputting the data? It can't differentiate the system uh, between an authenticated individual and other members of that group. Uh, you might also get, for example, a um, problem when a, a person is both a student and an employee of the institution. Um, and when you collect data against identifiers such as IP addresses or cookies, and attribute it to an individual, there's a danger that it doesn't actually relate to that person at all. So another issue um, to do with flawed or inadequate data is that um, sometimes these systems draw conclusions from a single data source, which can be dangerous. It's generally better to use data from multiple sources. Now, the, the two most commonly used data sources in learning analytics seem to be the LMS, uh, and the student information system. And those capture only a fraction, a fraction of the learning that's taking place. Um, so we need to do a lot of work to integrate data from other sources. Um, and that doesn't mean to say it's worth gathering data from every single source, uh, because some might have only a marginal effect on any predictions. And it may not justify either the expense or the intrusiveness of collecting that data. So that's flawed or inadequate data. Another issue is that predictions are not always valid or correct. So it's very easy to start thinking that a prediction from learning analytics is a fact. We all fall into this kind of trap sometimes, um, that we see stats, we see data, and we think there's something uh, factual about it. But of course, that's not necessarily the case. And um, we, we just have to guard against that all the time. Now, just, uh, just got slightly lost in my notes here. So, um, yeah, it's very easy to draw misleading conclusions from spurious correlations in particular. Now, I dare say uh, you've all heard of uh, confusion between correlation and causation. And this is particularly problematic potentially in learning analytics. There's an ongoing confusion in the minds of the public and even within universities between these two concepts. One of the main rationales behind predictive learning analytics is that there's a relationship between engagement in learning, and learning activities and with student success. So the argument is 
that if you can measure learner engagement, then you can predict subsequent retention and grades. And of course, if it looks like students not on track to succeed, then you can intervene in some way and try and bring them back on track. But engagement doesn't necessarily cause success, nor is engagement always associated with greater success. You may get extremely high levels of individual engagement sometimes, but that may be due to weaker students who are not understanding concepts and then having to work much harder than others. So they are endlessly hitting the LMS uh, without necessarily reaping the benefits of this in their final grades. And of course, you may also get exceptional students who can pass a course with virtually no engagement in the official learning activities. Uh, it's traditionally been possible to succeed in many courses just by studying the relevant texts off campus and without any recorded evidence of their engagement other than submitting assignments and taking exams. Now at Rio Salado College in Arizona, uh, there was an example of this mistaking, uh, confusing correlation with causation. Um, they identified a correlation between logins on day one of the course and subsequent student success. So those students who logged in on day one were likely to do better than those who didn't. Um, so what assumption did they make that those things were, um, that, that was a causal relationship? And they then encourage students to log in on their first day because they thought that would make them more likely to succeed. They sent a welcome email to future cohorts of students recommending that they log into the course website. But uh, unfortunately, the email turned out to have no impact on student success. And an alternative theory of the relationship between the early logins and success is that motivated learners are more likely to succeed and, of course, also more likely to log in on the first day of the course. So it's dangerous to put blind faith in these algorithms. Um, and we need to find ways to confirm the validity of the predictions, particularly when they're sold as black box solutions by vendors, uh, perhaps by employing new staff or consultant data scientists on a temporary basis. Or maybe we need some external validation service, some independent body that will check the algorithms uh, in software and uh, kind of certify them. Uh, that's complex in itself because sometimes these algorithms can be so complex and continually evolving uh, that it's difficult for anyone to understand them. But you could argue that if they're getting that complex, we shouldn't be using them to uh, take decisions about students and their futures. We really need to know how these things are working. OK, here's our next question. Uh, so you get a bit of a break from me. And uh, I'll just see some notes here. Adriana is asking me for a citation for the Rio Salado case. Yes, I, I do have that um, somewhere. So um, do, uh, not not right the second, but if you email me afterwards, uh, I'll just type my email in here. Uh, and that will remind me and I'll, I'll look it out for you. OK, uh, here's the next question. Could student autonomy in decision making be undermined by predictive analytics? What do you reckon to this? It's a question for you. And uh, please fire away. Do you think this is a potential issue here? Ian saying it needs effort to ensure informed rather than undermined. Joseph, yes, if you don't give them context, computer says I'm not going to pass. Patrick, is there a risk of students becoming dependent and abdicating responsibility? A good point.
So I think that captures some of the issues there. Um, it is, it is a, a potential problem which people have noticed, particularly with adaptive learning systems uh, and course recommender systems. Um, so course recommender systems are one of the four main uses of learning analytics that are evident at the moment. Um, and very big in the United States, uh, in some institutions where you have many thousands sometimes of different options for students to choose from. Um, and this, these are designed to help them make those choices, help them choose future courses which are predicted to result in them achieving better grades. But what happens if a student um, is given suggestions that are in conflict with her study goals? Um, so she might want to be um, an engineer, but the um, recommender systems are steering her away from the heavy engineering courses towards perhaps more on the management side uh, because of her progress to date on those courses that involve those skills. Just an example. Uh, you might also get an institutional philosophy that values high grades um, and rapid progress in its students, but this might not necessarily be in the student's best interest or what she wants. And you might even get algorithms that reflect and perpetuate current biases and prejudices in the organization. Another um, point that's been made is that adaptive learning systems, which continually change the content uh, to try and make it um, adapt to the, to, to the student's uh, level, they bring the potential to infantilize students by spoon feeding them with automated suggestions and then making the learning process less demanding. So is it important perhaps that automated processes don't give students the impression that everything is ordered and controlled? Ultimately, they should be able to decide for themselves whether to take up the suggestions made to them. A further concern is that as increasing numbers of decisions are based on algorithms, we could be judged on what are predicted to be our future actions rather than what we actually do. And also we may have echo chambers created by analytics where intelligent source software reinforces our own attitudes and beliefs. It, for example, introduces us to similar people, suggests courses and learning resources which match our preferences rather than challenging us. And you also find some academics are concerned that adaptive systems will take away their autonomy in how to teach a course. So let me see uh, what other comments people have made. Uh, Moriamo thinks um, student autonomy isn't necessarily going to be undermined by predictive analytics. Uh, students should be given training. I think that's right. Ainsley, ultimately the students still need to make a decision to respond to any predictive analytics. That's um, hopefully what we, would, what we would advocate, but you may find that um, it becomes deterministic, I guess, if, if, not, if you're not careful and the students um, believe these predictions um, and follow any instructions without really questioning them. That's what we have to educate students and staff uh, about, I think. Caroline, if a student finds out they are doing above average, they might slack off. This has been found in other areas using data to change behaviour. Yeah, that's a, a, a big danger, which quite a lot of people have noted and written about. Aperio, whoever that is, are the ways in which it might increase autonomy? Um, well, a good point. Uh, it might well do. And that's not something I've actually considered when I was looking at this ethical issue before. Um, so, yeah, maybe it, maybe it gives students, I mean, one would hope that this does give students more power um, over their own progress. Uh, isn't that the whole aim? So a, a very good point there. Jason, they have to be aware that it's just a guide and not gospel. Absolutely. And Henry, any use cases for analytics that lead to infantilization of students? It seems like suggests fine line between feedback that scaffolds and feedback that constrains. Um, I mean, I haven't seen any use cases for that. I've just read people that have mentioned that that could be a potential issue. And, and clearly, as we get more and more algorithms in different parts of our lives, 
suggesting courses of action, it runs the risk of taking away our um, ability to think things through properly, uh, I think. I mean, just an example of that is I don't use a GPS in my car uh, because on one occasion when I had to drive between three different cities in England, I realised at the end of the day I had, had absolutely no idea of where I'd been uh, and I didn't want to take my ability to read maps uh, away by just getting lazy and, and obeying the algorithm or, or the recommendations of the GPS. Now, I do use these facilities sometimes when I'm walking about a city to find somewhere, but I don't want to start, um, uh, I don't want to lose my, my understanding of where I am. Um, so in the same way, you could, you could imagine students might uh, uh, just start to become uh, less able to exercise their own initiative by too much spoon feeding. So anyway, some good points there. Thank you. And let's move on to uh, a couple of examples here. So um, a guy called Johnson discussed course recommender systems at these two institutions, Arizona State and Austin P. State University. Um, students were using recommender systems at both these institutions and were encouraged to do what people like them had done before. At Arizona State, their e-advising system attempts to identify students whose skills don't match up to their ambitions. And Johnson claims that learners are being thought of as mere collections of skills to be matched to an outcome rather than individuals. He suggests that these systems undermine students' autonomy and condemns the university's processes to compel struggling students to change their major as coercive, denying them the opportunity to take their own decisions. But he notes there's a softer approach of the course recommender system at Austin Peay State University, Tennessee, um, and that one encourages students to conform to the values and behaviours that the institution considers to be the most likely to result in success. So um, he thinks the way forward is to design system which, systems which encourage autonomy and help students to make decisions for themselves without a kind of institutional paternalism that these systems could bring about. Right, um, that's enough on that one, I think. Um, let's look at this one, which someone mentioned right at the beginning, potential demotivation of students. Um, now, information about where students are placed relative to the rest of their cohort has the potential to impact positively on your motivation levels. It might build on your spirit of competitiveness, particularly if you're a, an able student. Um, the attitudes and behaviours of successful learners can be used as an example for lower achieving students. But some learners who are labelled at risk may be motivated uh, to do better if they're equipped with skills and life circumstances to be able to do so. Um, but increased awareness may have adverse consequences for some of the less fortunate students. And predictions given to students may become self-fulfilling prophecies, which cause them to give up on a course they are predicted to fail. As the algorithms and metrics become more fine-tuned and trusted, perhaps that effect will even intensify. And some commentators have expressed a concern that labelling students as at risk could lead to them losing confidence and ultimately dropping out. So uh, it's a real danger. And um, I mean, in some situations, some institutions have rolled out analytic systems which give those um, recommendations, sorry, those um, predictions to the students directly and the students have, have dropped out of their courses early. But that is that is sometimes deemed to be a good thing because it means they can drop out before they incur any negative uh, consequences, uh, before they pay fees for that course, for example, uh, or before it stops them from um, packing it in and doing something that they're more suited to. So this, this is an issue. We don't have massive data, or I haven't identified a lot of data about to what extent this is a problem, um, but certainly something that we need to be on top of. But there's a strong argument that um, we shouldn't be helping students to take an ostrich approach. 
And if we know that uh, a student is likely to be at risk, likely to drop out, um, then we ought to be telling them that, uh, or that in itself is unethical. So another one, negative effects of continual monitoring. Are you going to be impacted in your um, progress, your learning, by knowing that you're being continually monitored? Now, uh, there's one institution in London that is uh, rolling out software at the moment uh, to deliver ebooks to students through their library and students uh, use of those ebooks is monitored by the software. I don't personally like the idea of lying in bed at night reading an ebook and having someone somewhere potentially uh, monitoring what I'm doing, seeing how long I dwell on a particular page. Um, I think that might um, have a negative impact on me, might even start sort of um, gaming the system somehow and, and deliberately spending too long on a page just to stuff up the stats. Um, but we don't know, of course, what impacts this kind of thing will have on students yet. And it may be that we are getting so used to uh, continual um, monitoring in all other aspects of our lives uh, and that that data is being used for far more insidious purposes by commercial interests than by institutions, educational institutions, that um, we're quite happy to accept universities potentially doing this, particularly if it's wrapped up in ethical policies um, where really no one should be looking at your stuff unless there's a very good reason to be doing it. And it's going to be uh, perhaps boiled down to a particular single indicator such as at risk or not at risk um, and therefore no one's going to be actually snooping on exactly what you're doing so um, but we don't know it could add to it could lead to increased stress levels or even non-participation by learners who feel that their every move is being monitored so that's uh, that one um, and now, uh, I mentioned potential gaming the system. This is an issue that quite a lot of people have been um, concerned by. Uh, it may be that some students, once they know that their learning activities are monitored, begin to game the system in attempt to improve their scores and ratings. Uh, a lecturer at one university I spoke to had asked a student why he was standing at the door of the library continuously slotting his ID card into the entry system. And the response was, I'm just trying to improve my library engagement score. Another possibility is that students will try to break the system or at least have some fun by presenting themselves as more active than their peers and appearing to engage in extreme ways. The more analytics that are presented to students through apps and dashboards, the more likely this is to occur. Um, and if gaming strategies are being built into student learning analytics apps in an attempt to make them more engaging, that might simply exacerbate the problems. So systems could potentially be designed, though, and Ryan Baker, uh, one of the um, leading lights in the educational uh, data mining uh, community, writes, it's been my dream and continues to be my dream that intelligent tutoring systems that incorporate detectors of, say, gaming the system and adapt in real time when students game the system will one day be commonplace. So we may um, increasingly see systems that, that spot that kind of gaming behavior and compensate accordingly. Now, someone else said to me that he'd seen a number of students at an English university queuing up to swipe their attendance cards inside a lecture theatre or the student cards um, and then immediately leaving presumably to avoid a boring lecture by going somewhere more amenable like their uh, home or a cafe. Um, that is at an institution where attendance at lectures is a requirement and the data is used for learning analytics. So it seemed that an organisational blind eye was being turned to that kind of behaviour. And that, I think, makes a mockery of attempts to develop valid predictions. A further possibility that some people have suggested is that students might wish to obtain additional support uh, and they might deliberately manipulate the data. 
Now, if you make the algorithms completely transparent so that everyone knows which factors lead to the triggering of, of an intervention, then a student may act in a way which ensures that that occurs. So that might be one argument for not making the algorithms transparent, although I don't think it's a good enough argument. Here's the next question. So uh, see what you think of this. Prejudicial characterization and treatment of students. Could analytics reinforce discriminatory attitudes and actions? You can probably hear me typing. Anyone get any thoughts on that? Could analytics reinforce discriminatory attitudes and actions? Yes and no from Patrick, it could undermine some prejudices. A good point, looking at the positive side again. Adriana, i.e. gender, yes, socioeconomic factors, etc. exactly. Uh, these might be, uh, or race, for example. Um, so, see if we've got any others. Evidence from US police <laughs> profiling systems indicates yes, indeed. Uh, of course this can happen. Um, if we're continually told that people from a particular ethnic group are uh, going to fail, uh, maybe that starts to increase the perception in us that those that ethnic group is, is just not as successful and then we act in a prejudicial way towards them. Right, I've got a connectivity problem there, Patrick, so you might want to try and make me a presenter again, please, if you can. Yes, yes. Um, I don't know if everyone else is getting these. That's the second one I've had. Um, I think it's just you. Right, okay. Uh, Caroline, uh, yes, I think I have read that it can reflect bias. And Joseph, again, yes, if not careful. If we give widening participation students support at lower intervention levels, then we might assume that they are worse. Okay, so um, some good points there. Um, we might find that negative or different behaviours are reinforced towards students who are labelled in a particular way, uh, particularly if they're profiled based on their race, gender or some other categorization such as campus based rather than distant students. Um, learners may be particularly concerned, and I know this happens because of read about it or heard about it, that data displayed about their mental health or learning difficulties could negatively affect attitudes towards them, perhaps reducing their opportunities to obtain placements with employers. So those kind of things need to be kept very uh, confidential. Now, among students as well, knowledge of the labels assigned to them may exacerbate the social power differentials and their status in relation to each other. So those in the most engaged category if there is such a thing, uh, they might want to stay together and be less willing to associate with those which the analytics flags as struggling students. This happens anyway. Uh, the bright students often congregate together and the less able ones do, but it might just exacerbate those trends and make it even worse. However, um, looking on the positive side, if it's used ethically, learning analytics and big data could actually help to identify and address issues of prejudice, prejudice, and differential treatment. So uh, I like that one. Uh, let's go to the next one. We've got reduction of the individual to a metric. Uh, and I like this one as well. Um, oversimplification of a learner's progress is one of the most frequently expressed objections to learning analytics. So any algorithm or method will by definition be reductive 
it's attempting create a, to create a manageable set of metrics. But students are individuals, they're not numbers, and institutions need to be wary of simplistic metrics which ignore personal circumstances and reduce learning activities to a number or, or a traffic light. And as I mentioned earlier, much of the data related to learning is held outside the institution or not even captured digitally in the first place. So it's impossible to create a totally holistic picture of a student's studies. Systems can't detect or are unlikely to be able to whether a student has failed to hand in an assignment because she's split up with her boyfriend, she's struggling with a particular concept, or she's recently had to take on paid work in the evenings to fund her studies or during the day and just hasn't managed to, to do it. Um, but uh, in, in one, uh, there are potential solutions here. When I was developing the student app, the requirements for the JISC student app at the University of Lincoln with students, they expressed a strong interest in being able to note the reasons for failure to submit an assignment or to attend a lecture. Uh, so that that didn't adversely affect any engagement scores. Um, of course, that's able to be um, gamed as well, but uh, hopefully most students will take this sort of thing seriously. Triage. Um, and uh, Adriana's off. Bye, Adriana. Uh, triage. Now, this uh, I'm sure you've heard of the kind of war situation where doctors are faced with various patients with different injuries, but they have limited resources and they've got to decide who to treat first. Do they attend those who are most injured out of compassion, even though they're certain to die, or do they concentrate their efforts on those with a chance of recovery? So it's not entirely analogous to education, but institutions do need to work out who to concentrate their limited resources on. They might put a considerable expenditure into supporting students with low levels of engagement or academic progress and ignore the better achieving ones. That is a common scenario. Does it make sense to spend money on learners who are strongly predicted to drop out? Or should you target your resources at those who are struggling academically but are still predicted to have a chance of success? And I was reading a, an abstract for a paper, sorry, a, a, an actual paper for a conference. I was refereeing one today. Um, where they were uh, suggesting that those students who are struggling academically but show high engagement are the ones who um, you should put resource into or the, who they were putting resource into. Um, but the literature also points out to the potential benefits of analytics for excellent students who need additional challenges. So this shouldn't all be about identifying students at risk of dropout. It can also be helping students at all levels. Those who are on for a uh, were on for a first class honours degree, um, but seem to be slipping and not fitting that profile of a successful first class student anymore. Um, perhaps they they can be just as assisted by recommendations than a, a struggling student who looks like they're going to drop out. Okay, all right, so that's triage. Next question for you. Should students be asked for their consent to collect data about them for use in learning analytics? This is a big one, and I noted at the beginning someone thought this was the biggest issue for them. What are your thoughts on this? Yes, uh, no, it depends. Let's see what comes in. So no, it's part of academic life from Tessa there. Henry, it depends. I wonder if there's an implicit consent in attending university, which uh, kind of backs up what Tessa just said. Tessa, ah, if you're using sensitive personal data, then yes. Uh, I mean, that's a, a legal requirement in the EU anyway that uh, you need to um, treat data such as uh, um, race and um, religion and membership of political groups 
in trade unions, you need to treat that particularly carefully. Uh, agree with Tessa from Marad. Uh, Victoria, yes and no. If the purpose is to show their own data to them via a dashboard, yes. If the purpose is in aggregate for an administrator and therefore presumably anonymous, maybe not. Moriamo, under the new DPA rule, we will be expected to collect consent. Now, that is not necessarily the case. Uh, I have talked to some people. This is a, a, a UK, or a, sorry, a, a European Union issue, so not that relevant for uh, people in the States or anywhere else. But um, it could be that you can still um, collect that data under the legitimate interests of the organisation. But this is this is a leak that we're straying into legal territory now. And I'm trying to keep this to ethics rather than legalities. Uh, we've got lots of lots of thoughts here. If uh, some opt out, then your picture is incomplete and could have bias from Joseph. Exactly. Caroline, it depends on the volume of data and the level of anonymity and sensitivity. Yep. Uh, Caroline Llewellyn depends how data is being used or sh shared with. There should be no surprises for students, so transparency is important there. Patrick, informed seems most important in terms of students being confident. Ainsley, exactly what Tessa said, but the processing of the data is different to what we're currently doing, so I feel we need consent. And my data protection um, officer thinks so too, or advisor. Moriam, according to our lawyer, that's the case. Consent is required. I know, but there's different legal opinions there, and we need to get to the bottom of this. Uh, in JISC and, and um, to be able to provide guidance there. Uh, and, uh, is your lawyer, well, let's not go into this just now because we're trying to stick to ethics. Lindsay, yes, that is what we have heard from students during focus groups. If they're informed, they feel more comfortable with participating. Um, we need to evaluate the risk to students and may need consent to do that from Ainsley. Okay, so let me uh, give you some thoughts on this. Um, some commentators have suggested that students should provide their prior consent to be intervened with by their institutions. Um, but Andrew Cormack, who's a legal advisor for JISC, argues that universities should put in place a two-stage process where data collection and analysis is justified on the basis of the legitimate interests of the organization, while student consent would be sought for any interventions. Um, that's the legal situation. Again, I'm trying to try not to get involved in the legalities here. I think just from a, a, um, a logistical process, a, a logistical, just from the logistics, it, it's very difficult to ask for consent for everything we, that we do with students. Uh, some people are making the point that this is kind of expected at institutions, that we are collecting some data. Some of it we have to collect for uh, reporting back to government, for example. Um, and some of it is collected because you can't have people um, use a, a learning management system, virtual learning environment, without collecting data about them. It just doesn't work. So students will um, sign policies, um, consent policies when they start their um, education. And um, those can be adapted and they are being adapted in some institutions to add clauses saying, and this data may be used for learning analytics. Um, and that's one potential way forward, forward, whether that's really informed consent or a meaningful choice is another matter because how many of us actually read the privacy policies um, that we have to click all the time every time we, we use a, an online service. So um, I think ethically, the, the, it's a complex situation here. Uh, certainly if we're going to be doing something that could be regarded as intrusive, such as um, using that sensitive data, uh, such as their racial uh, group, that, that might be something that you need to specifically ask consent that they're happy for you to do so. Um, the trouble is if you uh, ask for consent and um, then students refuse to give their consent, 
what are you supposed to do about that afterwards? Um, because it may be that as learning analytics gets more and more embedded in education uh, and more and more an integral part of it, it, it then becomes impossible for the student to take that course. Uh, so adaptive learning is a good example. There are some institutions in the United States that are rolling out adaptive learning systems extensively and carrying out large parts of their learning using these systems. And those are building pictures of students all the time. If, you, if a student's given the option um, to opt out, which I think is my next slide. Oh, no, it's not. Um, if students are given the option to opt out, uh, does that then deny them the possibility of doing that course in the first place? Uh, or does it deny them a major part of the learning? so that uh, they're going to miss out by, by doing that. So that's not really a meaningful choice to allow them to, to opt out. There's no doubt transparency here is very important, and uh, we should be telling students exactly what we're doing with their data. Um, and uh, I think, yeah, we, we still need to work out precisely what to do about this consent issue. Different institutions are handling it in different ways, but certainly we can't ask for consent for everything or the whole educational experience becomes um, meaningless if they then don't give their consent. Um, right, we've got about seven minutes. I'm just going to race through a couple of other things. External access to student data. So should you give uh, access to other organisations um, that student data? And I think this is an ethical issue as well as a legal one, because uh, students might not want that to go elsewhere. Um, for a start, we shouldn't be selling this data to others so that they can bombard students with advertisements. I think that's very clear. I think that's quite an ethical issue as well as a, a legal one. Um, but also that student might not want an employer for example, a future employer to know what's done with what, how they've been doing precisely and all their engagement with their studies. I'm not sure I'd want my current employers to know um, what I got up to when I was at university every minute of the day. I did all right in my exams at the end, uh, but I didn't apply myself continuously for the whole three years of my program. Um, and I fortunately had the chance to do some other things with my life. So um, that's, that's, that's one issue. Um, and also giving students access to their own data. Do, do the students not own this data themselves? Well, legally, probably the institution owns it. That seems to be the consensus among people I've talked to. If you use uh, a learning management system, then your interactions with that system are being recorded and the university or college owns that data. Uh, but, in European law, certainly, and ethically, there's a strong argument for saying that students should be given access to any personal data that you have about them um, and should get that in a, a format where they can they can take it with them, a, a, a portable digital format. And there are people that are talking about personal learning record stores and the potential advantages for students uh, so that they can take those with them where, when they move to a new institution, for example. So I think ethically, uh, even though the institution may own this data, there's a strong case for saying students should have full access to the whole lot if they want it um, and should be able to take it with them somewhere else. Uh, next question. Should interventions always be mediated by a human? We'll make this the last one. Absolutely not from Tessa. No, from Victoria. I'm not sure, not sure what your question marks are. Just implying what a stupid question from me, perhaps. Uh, Tessa, a nudge from a machine will help students without embarrassment. A very good point. See, I've had some people say to me, oh, yes, well, um, all we want is to get dashboards in front of personal tutors and then uh, the tutors can mediate the results so that we don't upset students. And there's no doubt that this 
data could upset a student, particularly if the messages are not sensitively worded. Um, but yeah, a nudge from a machine will help students without embarrassment. I like that. Anyone else? Oh, okay, so now it may be that um, given the possibility for misinterpretation of the analytics or demotivation or just erroneous predictions, some people think that predictions should always be presented to students by a human rather than an automated pro pro process. But I think that can be based on a narrow understanding of what learning analytics is. Uh, and perhaps a desire to preserve existing faculty student relationships. Often you get these uh, concerns from faculty who perhaps feel that their roles may be automated and that a computer couldn't possibly intervene with the required empathy and the detailed knowledge of a student's circumstances that they might have. Um, but uh, I've also read elsewhere that some people are more inclined to take uh, some students feel more comfortable with hearing things from uh, a machine than they do from a human. So uh, I think we, we don't fully understand these issues yet. We need to do a lot more research, um, but it's, uh, it's there's no black and white answer here, except that, well, my answer would be black and white. Actually, it would say um, that they shouldn't always be mediated by a human. There are situations where that might be better and situations where perhaps a, a machine might be accepted more by the student. And Ainsley says, maybe depends on the level of seriousness of the intervention. Joseph, if a human made an initial judgment and a computer said, could say someone with similar data to you had this kind of outcome, you might wish to take action. OK, I'm running out of time. I'm going to race to the end now. Uh, just to note that I developed a code of practice with a bunch of colleagues in the UK for learning analytics. And you're welcome to have a look at that. Um, that's just a few extracts from it and oh i just wanted to finish with this final um quote or um uh question which some people have referred to as the obligation of knowing if the analytics tell us that a student is likely to drop out do we have a responsibility to do something about it and i think this is probably the uh the key thing for me that not only do we have the risk of an institution getting sued um, because a student says, look, you knew all this stuff about me. You knew I was at likelihood of dropping out and you never bothered contacting me and therefore I dropped out. Um, but ethically, despite all these ethical objections we've had so far, we do know this stuff about students potentially and increasingly. Uh, we, we can identify those that are at risk. We can identify students that could benefit from additional support um, and if we don't use that, we're doing them a disservice. So that's where I'd like to finish. Uh, the URL of the Code of Practice, um, Victoria's just asked for, and Patrick's supplied yeah, Thank you. Yeah. And uh, that's where I'll end. So thank you all for listening very much. Um, feel free to get in touch if you want to uh, find out any of my sources for all this and uh, look forward to meeting you again, some of you at some stage and perhaps some of you for the first time. Thank you. Would, would you like to mention your book, Neil? <laughs> oh, uh, well, yeah, I've just written a book called Learning, Anal Learning Analytics Explained, which is uh, published by Routledge, will be available not till March, uh, but that's all, that includes a whole chapter on ethics and a couple of chapters on legal issues as well so um uh yeah that's i'll be available in march so thanks for all your comments there thank you very much neil that was a brilliant session um i hope everybody enjoyed it and uh have a good day have a good evening wherever you are <laughs> <laughs>